I watched Deadpool and Wolverine. And what did I learn? The multiverse must die. The multiverse was a concept really popularized by DC through the meeting of the Golden and Silver Age Flashes in Flash of Two Worlds. This would culminate in events like Crisis on Infinite Earths, but it was always a niche, nerd thing. Being able to distinguish the Batman of Earth 1 from Earth 2, or knowing that on Earth 11, every hero was the opposite gender. Sure, it slipped into a couple of animated series and movies, but never breached the mainstream until the CW came along and started using it extensively with crossovers like Crisis on Earth X showing an alternate Earth taken over by Nazis. It also brought back John Wesley Shipp as The Flash and Mark Hamill as The Trickster, at the time groundbreaking choices. They eventually did their own Crisis on Infinite Earths, which had cameos from Adam West's Batman, it had Brandon Ruth coming back as Superman, and various other old TV shows. And as the superhero boom happened and movie making started to become less risky, Studios had created a formula, but that formula was starting to grow tired. So now they needed a new, cheap, safe way to make money. And that meant looking towards the past, using nostalgia to bring in something familiar to audiences. And this has led us to today, where we have nostalgia baiting, cash grabbing, soulless corporate garbage. From Spider-Man No Way Home to The Flash. These big superhero movies are being made for the sake of an audience's applause. Not for the sake of letting artists tell the stories they believe will move the character forward, but to make people do the Leo point when background character 67 from that old movie shows up. It doesn't matter if we make heartfelt goodbyes to characters and actors. It doesn't matter if we try to evolve the superhero genre. Someone is always going to try and bring them back. Ooh, it's just like the comics though. Yeah, and everyone complains about it in the comics too. It's one of the most common complaints about comics. And following a comic book is an excuse for poor filmmaking anyways. Plenty of movies have captured the aspects without resorting to point and clap characters. It's true what they say. Nobody hates comics more than comic book movie fans. What are we doing? How do we get to this point? Charlie Cox, who plays Daredevil, was told to pause in his scene in Spider-Man because they wanted the audience to applaud. That's an insane thing to say, to tell an actor to change their performance for time to clap. And it's so clear, especially when we look at how Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man are introduced. Let's see, hop through portal, say some pointless things to fill in time, then take off mask and take several long breaths. Keep holding. Okay, back to speaking. They leave enough time for you to get up, go use the bathroom and get more popcorn. And it's not like the guys at DC are any better, digging up the corpses of actors who have been dead for decades to piss on their graves with CGI abominations. And the worst part about this Christopher Reeve cameo is that what else do you see besides Superman, huh? The Warner Brothers water tower. Reminding us that all these actors will become a corporate product for these studios to use whenever they want. You cannot retire, you cannot die, you will always be theirs. The Christopher Reeve cameo was made without anyone talking to his family about it. They had no idea it was happening until the movie came out. Imagine watching this movie and all of a sudden seeing a CGI recreation of your dead father popping up. And if you thought that was bad, George Reeves also made a CGI appearance. Someone who infamously ended his life because of playing Superman. At least James Gunn is making some corrections by having purchased the theatrical distribution to the Christopher Reeve documentary and having Will Reeve appear in his upcoming Superman film. But Flash also had a couple other very obvious point and clap moments with living actors. I mean sure there was Michael Keaton's whole role where he was just randomly repeating old lines. You're... you are... Yeah. I'm man but also the Nick Cage appearance, in which he fights the giant spider from Superman Lives. This could have been one respectable, because, you know, Cage was down to do it and he's still alive, and he's never actually played Superman, if not for the fact that Cage said his scene was completely different from what he filmed, meaning they CGI'd everything. The final scene with George Clooney too also emphasizes a moment to applause by ensuring it would all be in nice slow motion. Every multiverse-focused movie has been filled with terrible CGI, the result of the overworked and underpaid VFX workers who are forced to make the changes the day before the movie comes out 
or even when the movie is already out, like with Spider-Man No Way Home. Patch notes for movies, people. What are we doing? Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness remains the best live-action movie to pull it off, and that while it still does hold for applause cameos, it then instantly flips off those people hoping they had extended roles by massacring them within seconds, in increasingly disrespectful ways. It also uses the multiverse to finally have a good version versus bad version of character, with its Doctor Strange fight that has so much sauce. And that's because they let Raimi do some Raimi things, but too bad the script was terrible for that movie, because this really could have stood out and maybe made a difference in what a multiverse movie can be. What's unfortunate is that this is not only a live action issue, Spider-Verse dodges that problem in that the multiverse is the premise of the movie and not just for the plot, but for who the characters are. Miles trying to figure out his place in the world of Spider-Men is essential. But on DC's side, it bled into the Tomorrowverse, with its finale and Crisis on Infinite Earths, which has done some randomly stupid cameos. Spoilers just for fun, I guess. Like the Super Friends show up, the DCAU Justice League shows up, and gets deleted. At least it gave us a better finale for Kevin Conroy's Batman than Suicide Squad. And if it has to end, at least I go out like this, being Batman. And speaking of video games, Spider-Man is also heading towards a Spider-Verse, which is insanely dumb. The game does not need that at all. Like yeah, he appeared in Across the Spider-Verse for a second. But this dude hasn't even fought Green Goblin and has so much more that could be explored first. But let's go back to where we started this video. Deadpool and Wolverine. This movie spits on Logan's legacy. And I do respect that it is very clear about that from the very first shot. But this snarkiness quickly devolves. The rest of the movie takes everything good from the first two Deadpools, the screw you credits, the super fun supporting cast, and does it all worse. Or not at all. Because I guess letting the world know that this movie was produced by Marvel Studios and Kevin Feige and directed by Sean Levy is far more important this time around. Is much greater than 20th Century Fox or Tim Miller. At best, it's a version of The Flash without the dead people, moderately entertaining with a rushed emotional core. Hugh Jackman's Wolverine is that emotional core and he tries his best. But we've already got a movie that did an old failure of a Wolverine finding his redemption. One that did it so much better. The Honda Odyssey scene is by far the best in this movie from the way Logan rips into Wade, and Wade finally getting quiet. It then gives us the best fight scene in the movie as well, really messing stuff up and having blood and destruction that means something besides gore. But the rest of it doesn't even come close to trying to get that real. A bunch of quick allusions to a drunken Wolverine, and a romance I don't think anyone ever really cared for. Also, the Deadpool multiverse appearances are not cameos in this case, they are part of the supporting cast. They have a significant amount of screen time. But this is what the video is about, the multiverse. Chris Evans comes back as Johnny Storm, Wesley Snipes as Blade, Daphne Keene as X-23, the Cavalrine is here, and then Jennifer Garner as Elektra, and Channing Tatum as Gambit. These actors in these roles are certainly fun, the whole getting there anything is nice, sure, but just why? For a cheap applause as they make their walk in. But I'm sorry, if you clapped when Jennifer Garner as Electra walked in, I don't even know what to say. Chris Evans looked like he was pasted in over and over. But Daphne Keen, X-23, Laura. A vital piece of the success of Logan is just here for reasons? Deadpool literally does the point and gasp thing when she first appears. This isn't her Logan, and she shares a couple of lines with him. Then, OMG, she puts on the sunglasses, whoa, that's a reference. Ultimately, Deadpool and Wolverine is everything I despise about the modern superhero movie. A movie made for the Matt Ramos and Blu-ray angels of the world. People who do not care about what a movie means to them, but what it means in the greater essence of canon. The focus on old characters appearing. He's right behind me, isn't he, humor? Rush CGI, bad needle drops, ugly cinematography, and boring direction. Wesley Snipes awkwardly spits out a reference to his iconic line. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up hill. Jennifer Garner's Electra, yeah, once again, she was there. They're all there to walk out in a really bad needle drop to let their old selves hobble through action scenes. And to make you remember their time in this great Marvel universe. The color grading is better than it was in the first trailer, but that's not saying much. A large majority of the movie just still takes place in an ugly wasteland. And yes, you can make wastelands look good. 
This is just gray with maybe some white and brown. The final action sequence is definitely one of the worst one takes I've seen in a minute. There's been an obsession lately about doing one take fights over those with more cuts. And that just needs to stop. Just because it's one take doesn't mean it's good. While too many movies imitated Bourne's quick cutting, it's because they did it effectively and it looked cool. But here we have Wolverine weightlessly slashing at people and Deadpool wandering around before it ends with a cutscene from the Deadpool game. A very good game by the way. This movie has no sauce. In Wolverine's mask, eh, well I finally feel vindicated in saying that white eyes on Batman would not work in live action. It takes away so much from the performance and just looks so uncanny given that's not a full face mask. It's a real mask but it just looks really weird and it feels like Jackman's eyes are in the right place. A power of friendship scene to end a movie. In which, what do we learn? I don't know anymore. Oh yeah, Pyro and a bunch of old X-Men villains also show up. Kind of forgot about them to be honest. Maybe the weirdest characters to have appear. The movie ultimately becomes too obsessed with these characters and it's smug, look how meta we are humor, that it loses any sense of an emotional story. This is a sacrifice the first two movies were able to avoid, especially the second which was also led by a much better director. Okay, I will be a little nice now. The costumes, besides some of the pieces of Wolverine's main costume, I couldn't really ask for more. The Deadpool movies have always been willing to rip costumes straight from the comics and do it in a way that is earnest. All the alternate Wolverines, the Deadpool suit, that stuff is perfection. Like Channing Tatum's Gambit, costume is one of the best ever. And Channing Tatum as Gambit in general, I mess with. It's a fun nod to the movie that never was, and isn't a character relying on nostalgia. Tatum is legitimately one of this era's best comedic talents, and it's always fun to see him show the world why. The only other Gambit was Taylor Kitsch, who was also the most fun part of a bad movie. But the end credits are the best part. A surprisingly touching tribute to the 20 years of Fox's Marvel Universe. A universe with very high highs and very low lows. A universe that needed to exist to show the world a superhero movie could work, and later showed that they could be more than a superhero movie. With Disney's acquisition, thousands of jobs have already been lost, with the consolidation of studios. Something that is not going to change anytime soon. Let the multiverse rest. This is a time to strike with new, bold ideas. Break the formula. Don't go. Back to formula. There are so many hungry filmmakers who would love a crack at one of these movies and are willing to offer their ideas. Even their in-house guys have a vision that never gets fulfilled or ends up butchered in the editing room. Stop holding on to the past, to what was. The peak of the MCU is probably never going to happen again. With COVID and other economic factors, the box office is weak. But the box office should also not be the goal either. Movies aren't made for a character to appear for a scene and people to applaud. Movies aren't made for hundreds of videos to speculate whose arm that is, with a bunch of red circles and arrows on the thumbnail. This isn't what filmmaking is. It should be to make movies people will remember and love and learn from for generations. And how can that happen when filmmakers are being told to not look forward, to not try something different, and to not break out and show the world what a superhero movie can be? But you know, Marvel is realizing the multiverse saga is essentially a failure. And so if Kang being tossed to the side, maybe they could do something different. Bring in a new director, or at least one who has shown he has a special vision for how a superhero movie should look like. Replace Jonathan Major's King with Doctor Doom, or the Beyonder, who are the actual villains of both Secret War events. Create a Darth Vader for this generation. Maybe we get something special. Oh.